This is May 17th, 2020, and this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And let me ask you this morning, are you able to rejoice in the midst of the circumstances in which we all live? I trust you are able to, and to help bring comfort, I want to read for you from God's Word, Psalm 20. Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the King. May he answer us when we call. This is the word of the Lord. And may he add his blessing to it and his comfort to you. So again, greetings, Maranatha family. Trust all is well with you. And greetings to those who are joining us from who knows where. Uh, we are thankful that you're here with us. We trust that the Lord has brought you here to be with us in this virtual service of worship. And we are trusting that God has something special in store for you through his word, that he would draw you closer to himself and help you to appreciate, to treasure, and to worship Jesus Christ more than ever you have before. So welcome. We're glad you're here with us. And we look forward to his blessing. And with that in mind, let's ask him for his blessing. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are on the throne of this universe. We thank you and we praise you that there is nothing going on in this world or the entire universe that is not part of your good plan, working out your good purposes through history for the glory of your name and for the ultimate joy of your people. Lord, we recognize that these are difficult times for many. Our world is very much in a state of upheaval, and there is fear on every side, it seems. Lord, may we, your church, be your winsome, hope-filled, Christ-trusting people who are able to share the good news with power and effect to those around us who are struggling. Lord, we do pray for our world. We pray for those who are in leadership over us. We recognize that they are there by your provision, and we pray that you would use them right now for the good of your people. Give them courage to make right decisions, whether popular or not. Give them wisdom to know what the best decisions are. And I pray that you would also give them humility to trust that there is a God over them that they will answer to one day. So, Lord, give wisdom and direction and guide this situation. And, Lord, we pray for your people. We pray for your people who are part of this church family. You know the situations in every life. You know the, the joys and the trials. You know where there is temptation to fear. You know where there is heartbreak. And I pray that you would lift up the weary arms where that's the case among your people. And may they rest in you. May they know that you are trustworthy, and may we be able to truly rejoice in this day. And Lord, we pray to the end of being able to rejoice in you, that you would feed us from your word with your truth, so that we can rest on the solid foundation of your holy word as it points us to your character. So please, Lord, would you right now send your spirit, send your spirit upon me as I attempt to expound your word. And my words be faithful to your word and let them go forth with the power of your Holy Spirit. 
And I pray for all who are watching and listening in right now during this service of worship. I pray that you would now, wherever they may be, send your spirit and power to open their eyes to the truth of your word, to open their hearts to the glory of your word. Open their minds that they would understand your word and would you please feed your people. And where there are those who are watching right now that don't know you, would you do your work by your spirit of saving. Oh Lord, let your glory, the glory of the gospel, go forth with power in this day. In Jesus' name and because of him. Amen. Well... One thing that uh, I know about many of us is that we love our superheroes. Whether you prefer Superman, or Batman, or one of the Avengers, or someone else altogether, the box office receipts and comic book sales from decades ago make it clear that there's something about us as human beings that loves the idea that there could be larger-than-life figures who see us in times of desperate need, like pandemics of virus, and then swoop in with their superhuman abilities to bring rescue and beat up the bad guys that are in our lives. Well, in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament of the Bible, there are a list of names that are given to us that we've come to know as the Hall of Faith, or sometimes known as Faith's Hall of Fame. And I'd invite you to turn there with me right now to Hebrews chapter 11. The list of names here in Hebrews chapter 11, they include Abraham, who left behind him everything that he had ever known based on nothing more than a promise from God. He waited for decades and decades for that promise to come in the form of a baby boy miraculously born. He waited for decades for that promise to come. And when finally the promise did come, he was willing to offer that son as a sacrifice to God if that's what God required. That was faith. Or there's Moses who's on this list. Moses, who at 80 years of age, leaves a comfortable retirement to go and stand toe-to-toe with the mighty Pharaoh of Egypt, demanding on God's behalf, let my people go. And then he spends the next 40 years leading that thankless, belligerent people through a barren wilderness towards a promised land that he would never get to enjoy for himself. That's faith. David and Rahab are on this list, and verse 38 of Hebrews chapter 11 sums up God's view of these people. Hebrews 11:38. these are those of whom the world was not worthy. Now jump back and take a look at chapter 11, verse 32. Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Now, you read that list of names. Gideon, you probably know. Samson, you definitely know. But sandwiched between those two names is a man named Barak. And I wonder, what do you know about him? Barak was on the list, so there's something special about him. In fact, he shows up and he earns his stripe in the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5. And that's where we are this morning in our journey through the book of Judges, Judges, chapters 4 and 5. So why don't you turn there now. And what we're going to see this morning in these chapters is that this hero of faith doesn't stand alone. In fact, there is a whole lot going on in this scene of victory and rescue for God's people. Much more going on behind the scenes. So as I say, we're journeying through the book of Judges. We've seen two examples already of the spiraling cycle of sin that's uh, characteristic that drives the story in this book and dominates it. And chapter 4, verse 1, begins another one of those cycles. Follow along as I read chapter 4 of Judges, verses 1 to 3. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. 
The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. So the cycle begins again. Something to remember is that sin makes no lasting truces. Sin will not be content to be your slave and serve your pleasure. On the contrary, and we all know this by our own personal experience, sin always demands that we serve it. And when the pleasures of sin are long gone, the demands of sin will still call for more and more and more of you. We saw that last week with the tyrant Eglon, the king of Moab, who grew fat on the sweat and backbreaking toil of the Israelites who were living as slaves inside the land God had promised to give them for their freedom and joy. And what a picture that is of too many Christian lives enslaved inside the very land God intends for our delight, our treasure. Now, that's how chapter 4 begins, once more inside that cycle. Verse 2 of our text. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Now Jabin is, for a little background information, he's one of the major kings of the land of Canaan. There are many kings in Canaan. But Hazor is an important city, and Jabin is a very important and dominant king. King. Hazor, the city, is about 10 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It's close to the modern-day border between Israel and Lebanon. And until Joshua destroyed the city about hundreds, uh, 100 years before jo Judges chapter 4 takes place, this fortified city of Hazor was the most powerful city in all of northern Canaan. In fact, the remains of Hazor are still today the largest ancient ruins in all of Israel. This is an important city. And Jabin in these days has now rebuilt some of the glory of Hazor. And from this city, he is ruling over the Israelites inside the land. At the end of chapter 3, verse 30 of chapter 3, you notice the land had rest for 80 years after Ehud's rescue. But somewhere along the line, we're not sure exactly when it was, but somewhere along the line, the people of Israel have fallen asleep again in their sin. And while they are living asleep in their dreamland, the Canaanites are building up their numbers, developing their armed forces inside the land, right in their neighborhood, and now they've taken over. And Jabin may be king. But the text of Judges 4 focuses not on the king, but on Sisera, the commander of his armed forces. Verses 2 and 3 tell us a couple of details about Sisera. I wonder if you picked them up when I read them. First of all, that Sisera has at his disposal 900 chariots of iron. Did you see that? And second, that he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now, iron chariots, that's important here because in the world, in the days of the judges, that's cutting-edge military technology. It's kind of like having nuclear capabilities today. Israel, at this point, doesn't even have the capability to make iron, and Sisera's army has 900 iron chariots, and these are killing machines. Many of these chariots have metal plates hanging on the front to protect the warrior in the chariot from weapons coming in his direction. They also have blades that protrude from the hubs of the wheels, whirring like a blender and slashing anyone who isn't fast enough to get out of the way when they come through. Now, sure, you can't use a chariot everywhere. They can't go four-wheeling, and their skinny wheels are no good in mud. But on flat, dry ground, chasing Israelite volunteer soldiers who don't have swords and who are on foot, who do you think is going to win that battle? These iron chariots. This is the difference that allows Sisera to dominate the Israelites and keep Jabin in power over them. And the second thing I mentioned in verses 2 and 3 is the oppression 
Don't miss that emphasis there in verse 3. Sisera oppressed Israel cruelly. Now, wait a minute. Isn't oppression, by its very nature, cruel? Nobody says, oh, that wasn't actually a very bad oppression. It was, it was light, almost enjoyable. Nobody says that. So the fact that this oppression is emphasized as being cruel just shows how much pain Sisera is inflicting on God's wayward people. Now, by now, we're getting used to the cycle of judges. First comes sin, you remember that. Then that's followed by discipline. And thirdly, after the discipline, inevitably, the people cry out to God. They groan under the weight of the pain they're suffering. And that's exactly what they do here after 20 years of enduring Sisera. So after the people's cry, next step in the cycle is that the very God who has been offended by the rebellion of his people, that God listens to their groaning and he raises up a deliverer. We've met Othniel, the brave warrior. We've met Ehud with his hidden sword. And then at the end of the chapter 3, there is a man named Shamgar, who's a minor judge. We didn't even talk about him, but he kills 600 Philistines with an ox goad. So, by this point, when we get to this point in our present story, we wonder, okay, the people of Israel have cried out, what mighty man is God going to raise up this time? And we're in for a surprise. Let's read verses 4 to 10 of Judges chapter 4. Follow along as I read. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidote, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. I said this story has a surprise. Well, here's the surprise. The judge we're introduced to here isn't a mighty man. It's not a man at all, actually. It's Deborah, a prophet S. Deborah is the one who's judging Israel right now. She sends a summon to the north to a man named Barak. Barak means lightning in Hebrew. So as soon as we read his name, we think, ah, okay, here we go. Lightning? That sounds almost like a superhero, doesn't it? This must be the one we're waiting for. He has the right name. The flash, the green arrow, lightning. Doesn't it fit? And he also has a promise from God. Deborah brings God's word to him. Verse 6, go gather your men. And then verse 7, and I will draw out Sisera to meet you by the river Kishon. And I will give him into your hand. And everyone who can hear this conversation, who's been suffering for two decades now under brutal oppression, says 20 years of torture are about to be ended. God has heard our cry. Now is the time. So, Mr. Lightning, suit up. Get your superhero tights on and let's go get us some God-promised rescue. But not so fast. See Barak's response in verse 8. If you go with me, Deborah, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. 
Now, wait a minute here. Seems as though our knight in shining armor has lost a little of his sparkle, doesn't it? What kind of hero leader is this? Can you imagine Superman not going after Lex Luthor unless Lois Lane comes along to keep him company? Now, Barrack's been called to do a man's job, been given God's promise of success in that job, but he refuses to go unless the woman who gave him God's message comes along to hold his hand and give him courage. This guy is in Faith's Hall of Fame. What's going on here? This is worse than just being timid. Barrack is doubting God's promise. Has not the Lord commanded you, Deborah says, and Barak replies, I don't care what God says. They have 900 chariots of iron. We have none, and I don't like our odds. I wonder, do you see yourself in Barak, Christian? Jesus promises, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you as well. And we so often say, prove it. Prove it. How about you do the adding to me first, and then maybe I'll get the courage to get around to the seeking you part. Well, God makes his promises. He calls us to step out in faith. And we say, I need some proof before I believe. And the holy God of heaven would be completely within his rights to say, forget you. I can't work with this. I need somebody who really trusts me. But there is mercy here. I'll see the mercy of God in this text. He doesn't throw Barak off to the side. He doesn't punish the nation of Israel because there is not a single man in the country who's willing to put God's promises to the test and lead Israel. In verse 9, Deborah answers, I will surely go with you. In other words, the rescue will come. Oh, but there's a consequence for Barak. Nevertheless, the road on which you're going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So see now, at the end of this scene, see the warrior, the mighty warrior, going off to battle with his sword, as it were, and beside him, marching right at his side, is a housewife. This victory will be won by the hand of a woman. And I wonder how many times in my own life does my lack of faith in God shortchange me the pleasure of being used by him in the ultimate way? How many times does your lack of faith keep you from enjoying all that God has for you, Christian? Well, in verses 12 to 23 of our text, the battle is described. I'm going to read, follow along with me, starting at verse 12. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Herosheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harosheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, 
Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, No. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead, with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. Wow, what a story. Let's go back over it a little bit here. So Barak takes his troops up on Mount Tabor, the mountain near the valley below, where, and when Sisera hears about it, he brings his troops and he comes running. Of course he does. The enemy has cornered itself up a hill on a mountain. There's nowhere to escape. Sisera's army is like a pack of hunting dogs that has cornered a raccoon up a tree. The Israelites have nowhere to go. They've got to come down sometime. And when they do get down here to the flat plain below, there is no way they're going to outrun our chariots. That's what Sisera knows. And something else you need to know about Israel's armed forces here that chapter 4 doesn't tell us comes up in chapter 5, verse 8. You know, chapter 4 and 5 of Judges go together. Chapter 4 is the action. Chapter 5 is the hymn of reflection after the rescue. Chapter 5, verse 8. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? In other words, Israel doesn't have a trained military force. What they do have is a bunch of farmers who volunteer to form a militia and to come along with Barak to try to overthrow their oppressor. But they don't even have swords or spears or shields and spears, I should say, to fight with. So here is Barak. He looks at his motley crew on the mountain, carrying their shovels and pitchforks, and then he looks down at Sisera's troops amassed at the bottom of the mountain, and his heart sinks. It wouldn't yours? The enemy chariots, they flood the valley below, row upon row of lions, ready and waiting to pounce on their prey. And Barak hesitates again. This is definitely no General Patton we've got here. And again, Deborah steps into the leadership void. Verse 14. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? And finally, Barak stands up, steps to the front of his ragtag army of 10,000, and they follow him down the mountain, right into the jaws of the military force that's waiting for them there. And lo and behold, it's a rout. It's a rout, but the good guys actually win. Verse 16, Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Heresheth Hagoyim. That's Sisera's hometown. And all of the army of Sisera fell by the edge of a sword. Not a man was left. Not a single man. And we read that and ask, how in the world did this happen? A bunch of farmers with whatever farm implements they can round up for weapons. That doesn't happen that they would chase 900 chariots and take out an entire organized army. That doesn't happen in the world that you and I live on. So what happened here? Well, to get an answer to that question, turn with me to chapter 5. Chapter 5, in this song of praise that Deborah and Barak sing to the Lord after the mighty rescue they've just enjoyed. Chapter 5, verse 4. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. And then jump down to verse 21. 
The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. Okay, that may not mean anything to you yet, but let me explain to you the miracle here. When you see the torrent Kishon in verse 21, you need to know that the Kishon was a river, but it was no mighty river, nothing like the Fraser. For most of the year, this is an almost dry riverbed with barely a trickling stream meandering through it. But nothing matters to God when he's fighting for his people. Normal doesn't matter. And you see what happens on this day. According to verse 4 of chapter 5, at just the perfect time, when Barak and his men get down the mountainside to the flat plain where Sisera's chariots should absolutely crush them, precisely at that moment, God opens the heavens with a torrential downpour. There's a flash flood. The dry riverbed suddenly fills with water, overflows its banks like a raging river, and that, friends, changes everything. And these iron chariots, which just moments before were high-speed killing machines, now have to travel across flooded fields. They get their wheels stuck in the mud. They become death traps for their drivers because now they are sitting ducks. By the way, does that remind you of anything earlier in Israel's history? Like, say, crossing through the Red Sea, trying to flee Pharaoh's mighty Egyptian army that was chasing after the Israelites only to have God bring down the sea on the chariots of Egypt, rendering them not only inoperable, but rending their, rending their drivers dead. God is at work here. Well, verse 17 tells us that even though Sisera's army fell by the sword with no survivors, there is actually one person who gets away on this day. That's the commander. Sisera himself. He climbs out of his chariot and he makes a run for it. Now remember Deborah's prophecy? Barak is not going to get the glory for this victory that the Lord will hand Sisera into the hands of a woman. Well, the scene changes. Verse 17, Sisera makes it to the nearest settlement, to the tent of Jael, who's a woman. Now this is a safe place for him to run. The text tells us that there was peace between Jabin the king and the house of Heber, and Heber is Jael's husband. And sure enough, not only is this safe territory, but Jael gives more than a warm welcome. You hear her calling out from her tent, Turn aside, my lord, don't be afraid. And look at her hospitality. She invites Sisera in. She hides him with a rug like a blanket over top of him. And when he asks for a little water to quench his thirst, Jael does better than that. She gives him milk. And that's hospitality that goes above and beyond. Well, in verse 20, Sisera asks Jael to keep watch. And if any man, don't miss that, if any dangerous man comes hunting for me, they just tell him, nobody's here. Well, after a day of disastrous battle and a long run for his life, finally he's in a safe place with only a woman to worry about, and the military commander falls fast asleep. And that's where the warm welcome ends. The text tells us that Jael, the woman, wife of Heber, takes a long wooden tent peg, the women were the ones who usually set up tents, so she knows how to use one of these. She takes a tent peg in one hand, takes a hammer in the other, slips softly and gently to where Sisera is sleeping, and calmly she aims, and just as if she's setting up camp on some particularly hard ground, with determination and all of her strength, she pounds the peg right through Sisera's head and drives it into the ground. Well, seems that Sisera has worn out his welcome. I wonder if Jael forgot to put on her little plastic bracelet that, that morning to remind her WWJD, what would Jesus do? Does it make it even harder to accept when you read chapter 5, verses 24 and 26? Take a look there. Remember, chapter 5, 
This is not only God's inspired word, but this is also Deborah and Barak's hymn of praise. This is a song, verse 24 of chapter 5. Most blessed of women be jail, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. Verse 26. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera, she struck his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Now, this is a praise song? I haven't heard this one on 106.5 lately, and I'm pretty sure that Chris Tomlin hasn't put this particular scripture to music. Can you imagine the music team of our church standing on the platform and leading you in the singing of this? Let's stand and sing about jail this morning. Likely not. But don't miss here, friends, that God's promise through Deborah has been fulfilled now. The Lord's people have been rescued from their cruel oppression. Sisera has been conquered, and it was all by the hand of a woman, not on the battlefield, but at home in her kitchen. Verse 23, on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. So what's the point here of this story? I know that some of you are still struggling with the brutality of these stories in the book of Judges. Last week there's Ehud and the sword that drops the fattened calf Eglon to die in his own dung. Now we've got this week Zena, the warrior princess. What model can we possibly find worth following here? But before you turn up your nose in disgust at the Bible's account, just remember first, friend, this is warfare. This is not peacetime. This is a, a rescue operation, a rescue from injustice and brutal oppression. And we cry out for justice and rescue from oppression. We celebrate war heroes, heroes like, like Smokey Smith. I wonder if you've ever heard of him. He was the last surviving Canadian soldier from World War II to win the Victoria Cross comes from New Westminster, BC. He won it because one day he and his company had just taken a bridge in Italy during the Second World War. All the rest of his company was injured, so it was up to he and his buddy to guard and keep that bridge. Well, his other buddy got shot and now was lying helpless at his feet. Smokey Smith was all alone and the Nazis were moving in for the kill. Three German panzer tanks and an entire company of soldiers were coming towards him. They got within 30 feet of him and Smokey single-handedly fought off the enemy tanks and killed several of the enemy troops with just the gun he had at his side until that German company turned around and hightailed it for safety. We hear that story. We cheer. That's wartime. That's the good guys keeping away the bad guys. And in case you're not really sure of just how bad Sisera is, verse 30 of chapter 5. Take a look at verse 30 of Judges chapter 5. This is Sisera's mother waiting for him. Waiting for him to come back successfully, victoriously from battle. And it shows the heart of this military man. She looks out the window. She's waiting, and she's excitedly musing, Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man? Or as the NIV puts it, a girl or two for every man? In other words, part of Sisera's pleasure in conquering Israel is the opportunity to rape and kidnap the Israelite women, to defile them, to violate them, and then take them home as his trophies of victory to be shared with his men. And Sisera's own mother is celebrating with anticipation. Any of you have daughters out there? Would you be okay with this? Well, jail's tent peg stops the oppression. And we need justice. We instinctively cry out for God's order to be restored on this earth when it's out of sync. Because I don't want to live in a world where oppressors are free to get away with defiling women and trafficking in human lives and then celebrating it. And neither do you. So jail's tent peg ends two decades of brutal oppression. 
And something else about jail that you need to know, she's a foreigner living in a land. She's a Kenite. Her family has peace with Sisera. She has nothing to fear herself from him. This isn't her war. Ah, uh, but she has joined herself to the people of God. She risks everything to make God's promises her priorities. And when the men of the people of God refuse to take on the responsibility of leadership, then Jael, the foreigner, and Deborah, the prophetess, two housewives, step up to the plate. So Barak's name, it makes it into the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. But Judges chapter 4 shows that behind this victorious man are two women. So is that the point of the story, maybe you ask? Behind every successful man is a woman or two? Well, it may be true to life, and it is important. In fact, the God of the Bible, the Old Testament especially, gets accused often of being a misogynist, not treating women with dignity, not valuing them, often gets accused of demeaning women's rights. And there are religious religions that don't treat women with much dignity at all or hold them in high esteem, treat them as possessions of men. In fact, probably no religion is more guilty of that than the religion of atheism that says women have no eternal significance and are accidents of evolution with no ultimate purpose for being. Well, this story gives a window into what God, the God of the Bible, thinks of women created in his own image. It points to the bravery of jail. It points to the wisdom, the God-centeredness and bravery of Deborah. In fact, does anybody out there know anything about Lapidot? You ever heard of that man? It is a man. Well, it turns out Lapidot is Deborah's husband. You read about him in the very beginning of Judges chapter 4, but he barely rates a mention in the story. You know nothing about him, but the dignity of Deborah is on full display here. So the dignity of women in God's eyes, it's important here, but it's not the main point of the story. So is the main point of the story that Barak should have had bolder faith. If only he would have had bolder faith, he would have got more glory. Again, true. But we have a way of turning these stories into moralistic lessons. And that's too small of a focus. The point of the story comes from the story. You want to know the point of any part of the Bible? Look in the text. That's where it comes from. And if you look at the very center of Judges chapter 4, in verse 15. Verse 15 of chapter 4. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. There it is, right there. And the Lord routed Sisera. See the one who's doing the work here? Yes, Barak won a great victory. Yes, the sword caused the damage, but the subject of the verb here, the one doing the routing, is the Lord. And the point that we're supposed to take with us is that behind this great victory of Barak, behind the end of Sisera's oppression, is God. He's the one who's at work behind the scenes. When there's no man to be found, he raises up a woman or two. He gives the promise to Deborah that the victory is coming. When Sisera comes to fight, he routes the invincible chariots. He leads Sisera to, of all the places, to Jael's tent. You see, God is at work, and nothing will stop our God from accomplishing his purposes. Do you see how that applies to you right now, today? I was talking to somebody just the other day about how many people are living in fear these days. The world is turned upside down. We don't know the future. We don't know what tomorrow holds for health, for spread of virus, for economy. And so many people are desperately waiting, hoping for governments to come up with a solution. Oh, if, if only we had a political leader who would take charge, who would, who would have enough authority, not over just one country only, but over all of them, and who would make the right decisions to protect us from dangers like this virus. Oh, for a government superhero is what people are crying for. 
And I say, vain is the help of man. As Christians, we have so much better than that. Let me ask you, do you belong to God through simple faith in Jesus Christ alone? Is his finished work your hope? Is that what you're clinging to right now? If so, that means that you have the sovereign God of the universe working out his rescue plan for you. Let me say that again, because too often we miss the power of that truth through over-familiarity. Let me say it again. If you belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ, he is your Savior and Lord. Then you have the sovereign God of the universe working out his rescue plan for you. What comfort that brings. Now, do you see anything of Jesus Christ in this story? Remember back to Genesis chapter 3, almost the very beginning of the Bible? After Adam and Eve fall for the devil's lies and reject God, along with the punishment that they endure, comes the promise, the promise. There will be hostility between the serpent, who represents the devil, and the offspring of the woman forever. There was the offspring of the woman. That's, that's Christ, ultimately. The serpent would strike his heel, and the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Remember Israel's enemies in the Old Testament. They're more, meant to point us to our spiritual enemies today. And when Jael strikes Sisera's head and spikes it into the ground, there's a foreshadowing there of the Son of God who would come and crush the devil's head. Jesus Christ then comes and crushes the head of his enemy and ours. And in the mystery of God, Jesus does it with spikes too. Except in his case, he takes those spikes and takes them into his own flesh. He crushes the serpent's head by the piercing of himself. And you know what that means for us? It means that because of that, Romans chapter 16 verse 20 says, The promise is given to us. Brothers and sisters, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will do that. And that means that there is not a trial, not a sorrow, not a challenge in your life today that God is not using in his process of crushing Satan under your feet. And the question I have for you this morning that I want to leave you with is, do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Is that the truth that sustains you in your darkest times, that right now, in this situation, no matter what it is, God is working out my deliverance by crushing the head of Satan under my feet? Who's your sister right now? Who is he? Is it business or finances that are under threat? Health that's uncertain? Retirement plans that are all up in the air? Your fear for this nation or the future of the world? The story of Judges 4 and 5 says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid and shrink back, Christian. But look up. Look at the cross where your victory has already been won. Look there and worship. As we read in Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. May that be the song of your heart through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for these stories rooted in history, this historical accounts of how you have visited this world of suffering and cruel oppression, and you have brought victory, you have brought miraculous deliverance in often the most unlikely of ways. 
And I pray, Father, for your people who are listening in and watching right now. Oh, Lord, give us eyes to see above the tumult of this world, above the chaos that presents itself to our eyes when we look around. Lord, help us to see above it all and see you seated on your throne, working out your rescue for your people. And when our faith is weak, and oh how we know the weakness of our faith, help us to trust that your rescue doesn't depend on the strength of our faith, but it depends on the one in whom our faith is placed. And Jesus Christ has done the work. He has accomplished the victory and now works it out in the day-to-day -day experience of our lives. Help us to cling to him. And if there are those who are listening in who don't know you, oh, help them to see the glory of Jesus Christ. Help them to see him as their only hope. And set them free, I pray, to worship and delight in him. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Three questions as usual for you to discuss amongst yourselves as you finish watching this message or to think about on your own. First question, it goes back to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 38 and it describes the people of faith in Hebrews 11 as those of whom the world was not worthy. A beautiful testimony. I want you to think about what characteristics of Deborah, Barak, and Jael make them fit for that statement. That they are those of whom the world is not worthy. Second question, reflect on a time in your life when God stepped in to rescue you like he did Israel in Judges 4 from a danger that you could see no human way out of. We've all been there. I want you to reflect on one of those experiences and praise the Lord again for it. And third question, although the people of Israel were in the middle of great suffering, Deborah and Jael model a complete lack of fear and a great confidence. What do you think it was that set them apart from the fear that so many of their fellow Israelites showed at this time? Look at their example and trust the Lord. May the Lord bless you with this week. Amen.